All right, so we're going to talk about chapter two, uh, which is developing sustainable solutions. So in this chapter, it's a bit more what we call nebulous. So um, there's a lot of um, big ideas here that may or may not um, come to fruition, but the idea is, is to start asking the questions and building towards that sustainable uh, environment that you know obviously this whole course is based on. So I finished the first chapter and then I found these slides that a, a colleague had given me. So I figured I'd just insert them here in the beginning. So the, this whole thing with the hippo um, is a little bit of a review from the last chapter, but it's still uh, hugely, you know, pertains to everything going on. And uh, this will definitely be on the first quiz. Um, so make sure you understand the whole hippo concept. It's an acronym, of course. So. All right, so HIPPO is an acronym, like I mentioned. And if you don't know what an acronym is, an acronym is where you kind of take the first letter and then you use it. Maybe in school you use the the, PEM, the PEMDAS one where to do uh, the order of operations, parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, addition, subtraction. Oddly enough, I never heard of that before. Um, I just, I kind of, I, maybe I just memorized it, but apparently there's a, there is a, uh, a uh, acronym for that. So the HIPPO is an acronym that's used in ecology and environmental science to describe sort of the big concepts that need to be addressed when dealing with sustainability. So HIPPO, the H is stands for habitat loss. Again, I've already covered some of this stuff a little bit. We're going to obviously talk about this, uh, some of these topics way more in depth um, later on. But uh, the I is for invasive or introduced species, which we did talk about a little bit. P is for pollution. Obviously, you know, you want to get rid of pollution. The other P is for population growth. Again, we talked about it a little bit in the last chapter. Plus, there's a whole nother section on that because it's a massive, massive issue when it's dealing with sustainability. The O is for overconsumption or overharvesting, and we'll talk a bit about that, but, and that'll be a sort of a common thing as we go through the semester as well. So sometimes uh, different authors use different, uh, uh, slightly different uh, acronym for it, or uh, excuse me, different letters, but it still stands for the same things. So you got habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, population growth, and overconsumption slash overharvesting. That's where the hippo comes from. And these are sort of the overreaching or over uh, arcing, that's the word I'm looking for, overarching sort of the umbrella that, of which a lot of what we're going to talk about falls into. All right, so if you're talking about pollution, obviously you're going to talk about groundwater pollution, this type of pollution. Um, and to get rid of that makes a better sustainable environment. Same thing with habitat loss, which we've mentioned. All of these are sort of the overarching idea of what sustainability is. So again, we talked about this a little bit, so I'm just gonna briefly mention this, you know, where you're introducing either on purpose or on accident, a new species that all of a sudden dominates where, where it's been introduced because it has no natural predators and it just it takes over and kills off a lot of the ecosystem that was already naturally there and sometimes can really uh, create havoc like we saw with the, the, the cane toads in Australia. Hopefully you uh, went and looked at that article. It's kind of funny. Um, so the problem is, is, you know, when you, with population growth, you have de a decline in ecosystems for wild animals their their ecosystems get squeezed because humans are expanding at such an alarming rate and then some uh some things get introduced and then we try to fight that with something else and it turns out whatever we try to fight it with ends up being even a bigger problem so we talked about this we'll talk about it more as we go on but habitat loss is definitely one of the uh, the big things for sustainability um obviously invasive species and I, that's exactly what we were just talking about so um, zebra mussels going back to that are a huge problem here in the great lakes region um, uh, another one is the uh, the emerald ash borer in fact i had to drop down one of my, my trees in my front yard for that very reason it just died the emerald ash borer is a huge problem 
up here in the I mean it might be everywhere I'm not even sure but, but those little buggers they, they wreak havoc and any ash trees that you might have and they can destroy tree after tree after tree in a very short period of time and finally I just had to take the whole thing down um, so again you know when man tries to you know fiddle with the natural order of things the consequences don't always turn out the way you want and we talked about that with the law of unintended consequences and this is exactly what can happen with this again it could be by accident like with the ships coming in from the ocean bringing in things that aren't normally found in the great lakes and then all of a sudden they blow up like the zebra mussels i mean that's unintentional but it happened Whereas things like the toads in Australia, those were brought there to fight something and ended up being the bigger problem. Pollution, again, you know, we're going to talk about this a lot. So there's not a whole lot to discuss here. Basically, the alteration of natural conditions. We all know what pollution is, you know, uh, between, you know, like the sewage plants or, you know, factories, this, that. And there's a whole topic on this so me explaining it now I mean we all know what pollution is but we'll, we'll go into more greater detail down the road human population growth you can't talk about sustainability without it I mean right there we're, we've already talked about this and we're gonna talk about it more there's a whole nother unit on this uh, the problem is is you know again the more people the more you have to feed <laughs> you know the more pollution that's created, the, you know, introduce species, and it's it becomes this snowball effect of where does it end? Because you know, with population and now 7.3 to 7.5 billion people, you know, think about this: the, uh, roughly 200,000 people a day are born. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a fairly large sized city being born every day. Now, yes, there are deaths as well, but with Medicine being as good as it is, I don't, the, the you know the death rate is probably slower than the birth rate. And then overconsumption, overharvesting, you know this is definitely a, a problem. Not everywhere, but you know as human growth, you know the population growth expands, you know this is where you know this becomes a huge problem. You know using more resources than what's necessary for survival you know basically in a nutshell this is convenience right um do we need so much of this food you know gas energy and if you look at the number there 40 percent of the food purchased in the u.s ends up in a landfill think about that you know it's it's very wasteful and i i admit i'm probably just as guilty as everybody else i have a picky family and you know they don't like leftovers and so i feel bad when i gotta throw food away but no one's gonna eat it so um and then you know plastic wrapping and i will admit this is a bit of a pet peeve of mine there's there's a lot of stuff that's just way way over 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 packaged um you know, whether it be for marketing purposes or freshness purposes or whatever, there just seems to be no middle ground right now for that type of stuff. It's just, it's like either, you know, it's <laughs> super tough plastic or it's just way too much. So anyway, looking at all of this, that's sort of that hippo thing. I just wanted to bring these in, kind of continue the conversation from last time um, because you know, these are those five, you know, understanding what this is. And again, it will be on the quiz. The hippo stuff will be on the quiz is where this whole course is kind of going in terms of of this is this uh, sustainability um, uh, aspect. All right. So I'm going to kind of now get into more of the chapter two stuff. Um, and the beginnings of sustainability. So this chapter is a little bit of like sort of history slash policy, and you'll see that as we go along. So, you know, there's been naturalists and conservationists scattered through, you know, way, way back. You know, it says right here, the 1600s. And, you know, uh, from our perspective in America, it really kind of started in the in the early 1900s. President Teddy Roosevelt 
made it, it was the first president to make it a national agenda. You know, we were going through the depression and he put people to work planting trees and all of this stuff. And um, he then realized that, you know, how important it was to conserve these natural beauty places in America and started setting aside huge tracts of land and designating them as national forests, parks, and monuments. Um, first being Yellowstone. You know, and I've gotten to see some of these. Hopefully you guys have seen some of these. Yellowstone is gorgeous. Uh, Glacier National Park way up on the border of Canada in Montana is probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. Um, I've never gotten to travel internationally. There might be other things, but Glacier National Park is absolutely breathtaking and it was set aside it's protected you know things like that and you know all of these tracts of lands and you think about um, all of the national parks and monuments you go to like in uh, Utah with the, the natural bridges and arches and Bryce Canyon these are geological formations uh, that are only found in these kinds of areas. I mean, you can't find them anywhere else. So they saw that right away saying, hey, everybody should be able to enjoy this. Let's set this aside and go from there. And, you know, there's obviously national parks and everything out east, out west. Acadia National Park in Maine is one of the most beautiful parks. I've never been there, but I know people and I've seen lots of pictures. And it's like basically a tiny island in the Atlantic. It's almost one of the farthest most eastern places you can go in the country so they these types of forests and parks are found all over the place i don't believe wisconsin has any national parks that i know of but we do have national forests we have nicolay national forest which is uh about two three hours north of milwaukee i've driven through there it's beautiful that's a national forest though and then later on, as, as the decades went by in the 50s and 60s is where we really started to see people ramp up this, this idea of environmentalism. So from the dawn of the Industrial uh, Revolution in the late 1800s and through the 1900s, a lot of stuff happened that was completely unregulated. I mean, they, they really polluted the bejesus out of everything. Uh, lake Erie was almost considered a dead lake. Um, by the 60s and 70s um, because of just the, all of the steel mills and everything just pumping all of their pollution into that lake and it's not a really deep lake so it just it almost killed off everything in that lake uh, well the good news is starting in the 50s and 60s um, people started to realize hey something needs to be done about this and we'll talk more about all this stuff so things like the EPA was formed and <clears throat> the Clean Air Act and all of this stuff and there is a noticeable difference that has taken place since then because the regulations have been put in place to help keep pollution to at least a minimum and then go after those who are still breaking the rules, so to speak. So it wasn't until the 50s and 60s and further that people started to sort of wake up and realize the damage that had been done and then start to figure out ways of fixing it. So here's a timeline sort of for suitability. Now, again, this is, you know, mostly America, right? Not everything, but a lot of it is. So you go back into the 60s and that's when the Clean Air Act was was it, uh, was passed. And that was a huge stepping stone to start realizing, hey, we can't just allow these factories to belch all this stuff into the atmosphere. You know, we acid rain used to be a real thing and we don't really see that too much anymore because of the rules but acid rain is when you have all these factories like steel mills and stuff like that they all of the stuff coming out of their smokestack it contained nitric uh, nitrous oxide that what that would do is it would condense and create nitric acid <laughs> or hydrochloric acid if, with hydrogen compounds so we're not going to go into all the chemistry but the point is is that stuff would literally create an acid when mixed with water and then that water fell as rain and would do damage to lakes and rivers and everything else it was it was a, a real big big deal you could see Earth Day there, first Earth Day back in, uh, I can't see the, 1968, seven, no, 1970-ish. Earth Day was actually um, 
created and enacted by a Wisconsin uh, legislator. Uh, unfortunately, his name escapes me at the moment. And then you got things like Greenpeace founded. So Greenpeace is an environmental action group. They they have huge ships and patrol the oceans to make sure people aren't doing illegal things. You got things like DDT banned, which was a chemical that was used for all kinds of stuff. And then they realized how nasty that stuff was. Um, the Endangered Species Act, which allowed uh, animals to be uh, basically protected to get their numbers back up before they became extinct, right? You don't want anything going extinct. Love Canal and Three Mile Island, unfortunately, were very nasty uh, uh, incidents. Three Mile Island was a huge pollution issue, and uh, or excuse me, Love Canal was a huge pollution issue, and then Three Mile Island was a, a nuclear issue. <laughs> Um, you have Superfund there. If you don't know what a Superfund is, that's a federal program that takes uh, just millions and billions of dollars to help clean up um, uh, old sites that are just horrible. Um, it, I've I've actually been to one in Montana um, that was the largest copper, one of the largest copper mills in the country at the time, this is the late 1800s. And then when it was bought out, I forgot who bought it out. Shortly thereafter, <laughs> they were told they had to uh, basically clean up the top three or four feet of ground earth. Now, that doesn't sound like much until you see how much there is they have to clean up. The whole project, I think, I, in total, it was supposed to take about 150 years. It's it's massive. They've already cleaned up quite a, a bit of it, and they've even put in a brand new golf course there where they've actually cleaned it. So things like that, there's super fun sites that I heard about in the Southwest part of the state. Um, if you don't know what creosote is, creosote is a nasty chemical that's used in things like making telephone poles. Telephone poles are wood that are soaked in this stuff to make them basically immune to the environment. So they don't deteriorate in the rain and all that. The problem is, is that the creosote has things like mercury in it and all this nasty stuff. And um, again, before the regulations were put in place, <laughs> a lot of this stuff was just unregulated. And um, uh, another kind of story is that in one of these old mills down, I think it was in South Carolina, I was doing what's called Hazwopper training. And that, that's to help you understand how uh, hazardous cleanup is done. It's done for a lot of different types of jobs. You have to take it. And the guy was telling us a story that he was on a job cleaning up at a super fun site down in South Carolina where they were literally using push brooms to, to essentially mop up all of the mercury that was on the ground. Now, if you don't know anything about mercury, that's what they used to use in thermometers. Mercury is one of the most deadly chemicals you can get around in a, a human body. Once it's in your body, you can't get rid of it. Um, and it's it's carcinogenic, which means it can cause cancer. So mercury is nasty, nasty stuff. That's why they don't use it in thermometers anymore. So there's all kinds of other things on this. I could tell all kinds of stories about this, but the idea is, is that as time went on, going back to the early 60s until today, you know, going um, more and more and more has been done, not just in America. A lot of the things I mentioned were America, but uh, some of the stuff then went international, you know, like the Brundtland Report. OK, that was done by a Swedish gentleman. So this isn't just America anymore. So why sustainability? Well, okay, here's the, we just talked about the hippo stuff, right? And again, these are gonna be common themes throughout the semester, habitat loss, invasive species, pollution. But we're also gonna talk about global warming and climate change. You can't talk about sustainability without talking about it, uh, climate change, because they go hand in hand. If the temperature is gonna be raised, it's gonna affect how crops are grown, the growing seasons, all of this stuff. All right, they're all interrelated. All right, so hippo and climate change can be addressed by adopting sus sustainable practices. I will actually learn how to pronounce sustainable by the end of this semester, I promise. Um, so all of these play a role, and that's why I put the hippo at the beginning of this particular lecture to emphasize those five things right there, along with global warming and ch climate change and a few other things 
that's the you know the nature of this entire course. So make sure you understand those concepts. So, in 1987, the Norwegian Prime Minister authored what's called the Brundtland Report, and it was sort of the definitive um, stepping stone for modern sustainability practices, modern environmentalism, basically trying to address the fact that the world is using up resources faster than they can be renewed, whether it be petroleum, you know, uh, just uh, uh, agriculture, all of these things, overfishing the oceans, all of these things need to be addressed because again, they are interrelated and you have to be able to put that in writing for everybody to understand globally because it's a global issue, it's not just a country issue. Now the countries themselves have to take that lead role within the confines of their political boundaries, but it's still a global trend that these need to be addressed and in order to achieve sustainability based on environmental and, here's the big thing, social factors. Now, everybody understands sort of the environmental part of it, right? It's, it's based in science. It's kind of hard to refute. But the social factors are what really set sustainability apart from just environmental science. You have to convince policymakers. You have to convince the general public. You have to convince everybody to buy into these, uh, to adopt these sustainable practices. And that's where a lot of the, uh, this becomes difficult because you you just don't it's not hard easy to do based on things like economics religion all of these things play a role you know just general societal norms for each each nation around the country you know what they believe in in Japan might be very different than what we believe here in America we're both advanced societies you know we're both developed nations but we have very, very different core societal values. And what they think might be important, we might not think is a big deal and vice versa. So the societal factors are one of the real tipping points in terms of trying to get people to do this stuff. And again, we're gonna talk about that all semester. So here's some, some Venn diagrams, if you, uh, hopefully you've seen these, where you have sort of the overlap of what's gonna what hopefully will take place right so you could see in the left here you have uh, the social i'm gonna grab a marker here does this work yep you have social environmental environment and economic now again these are the big picture items for how to build a sustainable future all right and this is where it becomes difficult because the overlaps might mean something different to uh, different people. Is it bearable environmentally? Can we get, get away with it without just crushing everything around it? Is it viable? You know, between the environmental and the economic part, is it viable? Because if it costs um, too much, it's gonna be very, very difficult to get it to work. Now, one of the things I've always said in this, and, and this is my own personal belief is, you know, if let's say California and the feds just spent the $2 billion needed and built a desalinization plant on the West Coast, it would probably solve all the problems that they have with water so they didn't have to use all the aqueducts to bring it in from the Rockies and the Rio Grande, which barely makes it into Mexico now. Or, uh, yeah, um, the pro or the, excuse me, the Colorado River, not the Rio Grande, the Colorado River, excuse me. Okay. You know, a couple of, one or two of the, I think Kuwait in the Middle East, they built a desalinization plant. They live in the desert. So the only viable water they have is the ocean. You can't drink it. You remove the water, the salt from it. It becomes, now you can drink it. Plus you have the byproduct of salt. You can sell that. Everybody uses salt. Salt is everywhere. So, you know, in my opinion, if they had just said, screw it, let's just go build that desalinization plant off the coast, you know, uh, by California, it would have solved many problems. The problem becomes getting the politicians and everybody to buy into 
how much that price tag is going to be. And it would be probably a couple of billion with a B dollars. But the payoff would be huge. But the, you know, sticker shock is sticker shock. We all get it, right? So, you know, and then if you can, obviously, in a perfect world, all these three things would come together perfectly where everything could be agreed upon in terms of environmental aspects, the economic aspects and the social aspects to create a sustainable environment. You know, it's hard though. Now you could take that same sort of thing and if you look at the one on the right and just exchange out the words environment for planet, economic for profit, I know it's hard to see that, sorry, and social for people. It's the same thing, exactly the same thing, okay? It's just the hardest part is, so the environmental part people get, it's science-based, right? The economic part and the social part, are, that's a whole tricky business. Somebody's got to foot the bill and then you got to get people to buy into it, all right? And that that's where the real hard part becomes to get some of this stuff done. Now, in addition to the Brutland report, you also have uh, a couple of other major stepping stones in terms of um, pushing environmentalism and sustainability forward. And one of them was called the Earth, uh, Earth Summit, which took place in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1992. So here, 172 countries gathered. I mean, there were thousands of people here. So you had multiple, you know, it wasn't just 172 people. There were thousands of people there. And it was the whole crux of this particular summit was to figure out the order, what needed to be done to achieve sustainable development and what attitudes and behavior must occur. What, what do we have to change in order to make that happen? Well, some of the things that they prioritized that came out of this, this entire summit was making eco-efficiency a guiding principle for business and government. So when projects are being made or being funded, there should always be in the back of their mind, how can we make this eco-efficient? You know, does it have to be, um, you know, petroleum-based? Does it have to be, you know, what can we do? Can we take this building and give it a green roof or something like that? Always, you know, don't let, the bottom line dictate to take the shortcuts to avoid any type of eco efficiency because the benefits in the long run out usually outweigh the price tag in the short run. Again, it's just hard to convince people of that. Reducing the production of toxic components. Now, granted, this is back in 1992. So back then there was a thing called leaded gasoline. My first car, it was a leaded gasoline car. All right. Um, that's right around the time um, lead was being phased out. You couldn't find it very often, but my car technically required it. And there was a gas station not too far from where I live that still carried it. By 1993, 94, or something like that, leaded gas was completely phased out. And for good reason. I mean, you just don't need it. Um, and it, now the cars burn cleaner. The engines last a lot longer, things like that. And, you know, you just don't have that that toxicity in the gasoline anymore. So the, the next one would be the development of alternative sources of energy to replace the use of fossil fuels. So this is where the alternative energy sector really started to ramp up. Hydro, hydroponic, or excuse me, not hydroponic, <laughs> hydroelectric uh, uh, fuel, or you know, like building dams, although those are still controversial. A big one was wind, right? The, 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 the sort of the advent of windmills. Windmills have been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, go, the Dutch have had them for years for turning uh, pumps for water. But, you know, utilizing the fact that there are some very windy areas in this country and, you know, the technology was such that they could build them uh, economically viable. Again, there's that word viable. The, the cost was less than what was going to be uh, coming out of it in, in terms of uh, the energy created. So if you've ever driven across the Hone Bridge uh, by the Port of Milwaukee, you'll see that single windmill down there that connects into um, 
there's a, a Wii Energy station there. I forgot, or is that the Coast Guard? I forgot what it is. I got them at the block. That thing runs all the time. In fact, it runs so much they started selling the energy that they've been producing just from that one one windmill. So unfortunately, the unfortunate reality is, is you need a ton of windmills to generate the power of the needs for this country. You would need millions of them. All right. Well, we don't want to do that either. But the idea is, is the more windmills there would be, the le the less you know petroleum based fossil fuels are required. Okay. You know, I don't know if there'll be a day when you never have fossil fuels, but it might be one of those things where you might only need them for certain things at certain times where other alternative energy sources take up the bulk of the, you know, the, the heavy lifting to create the energy needs for the country. The other one was develop a public transit system, reduce vehicle emissions and health problems caused by polluted air and smog. Now this one, this one still hasn't taken off and it's a bit controversial in some areas. So for large, large cities, and when I say large cities, I'm talking New York, LA, Tokyo, Mexico City, the largest of the large cities, absolutely. There, you know, public transit, stuff like that is definitely a huge uh, motivating factor. You know, I've never been in New York City, but all you ever hear about is the subways, right? There's subways to go everywhere. People barely drive cars because there's nowhere to park them anyway. So that's great. However, in a city like ours, did we really need a trolley? <laughs> <laughs> That's my opinion. Sorry. Uh, we really didn't need that trolley to go in a circle. I mean, there's just nobody riding it. It just didn't make sense. I, I'm sorry. I just disagreed with the trolley, but that's my own opinion. But I'm saying public transit is important for many reasons, both from an aspect of if it can just reduce a few cars on the road to obviously not everybody owns a car and you need people to be able to get to work and things like that. So that public transit is always going to be an issue and it should be an issue. It just needs to be done responsibly. And then finally, the last real big thing, again, it, this isn't in our world necessarily, but around the world, it is huge. And that's addressing the scarcity of water. You know, we are blessed in the, in, not only in America, but especially up here by the, the Great Lakes to have lots of water just in our backyard. But a lot of parts of the world, that's not the case. I mean, world uh, Water is a premium, you know, it's scarce. You know, think about how much area is covered by deserts and things like that, or just areas that, you know, they might have water, but it's super deep and the, you know, the economics aren't such that they can just go drill a well and pump it up. So that that scarcity of water, because water is a, ne a vital necessity for life, we need it. We we can go longer without food than we can go without water. You got to have water. So that you know, in a nutshell, is you know that's a huge thing that needs to be addressed. So another big stepping stone for sustainability practices um, was the UN Millennium Project held in 2002. So it's kind of like the Earth Summit, but, you know, about 10 years later. So this one sort of tried to address even more of the social aspects that are uh, inhibiting sustainability. So things like eradicate um, extreme po poverty and hunger. You know, we have more than enough food on this Earth right now. You know, I mean, look, like I said, in America and America exports a ton of it, a ton of it. I mean, a lot of the stuff grown in this country is just shipped off to other parts of the world. And I'm sure there's other countries doing the same. However, that still isn't getting to the places it needs to be all the time. Now, sometimes that's political. You know, if you got a sort of a, a civil war, internal civil war going on, bad things can happen. And when food gets shipped in, the bad people have a tendency to be able to get their hands on it. So things like that are out of their control. But trying to really hone in on which areas of the world need the food the most was something that was addressed in this project. Um, achieving universal primary education. So, you know, we take it for granted that, well, everybody goes to school. Heck, it's the law here in America, right? You got to go to school through senior year of college or high school. 
After that, you're on your own unless you decide to go to more school. In lots of parts of the world, that's not the case. Um, and then even if they have school, you know, it's a lot of times, you know, they can only get up to maybe what we'd consider grade school efficiency, uh, equivalents, excuse me. You know, trying to sort of level that playing field with education has been something that's been going on for many years now. You, you know, kind of like doctors abroad, they also have teachers abroad, you know, p t teachers that go out and, you know, they'll go to small villages and try to teach them sort of those basics of life kind of thing. Um, so, you know, education is something that you, the, the more educated people are, the more they understand how things work and why they need to be a certain way. So that's, that's a good one. Um, promote gender equality and empowering win, women. Well, this one touches on a few things because in some areas of the world, you know, women aren't allowed it's somewhere, some places, they might not even be allowed to vote still or work or anything. They're the mother figure. They take care of the children. They cook, they clean. That's what they do. Well, the problem with that is they don't realize what a lot of uh, societal societies that have that in place don't realize is that, you know, women are way more than that. <laughs> we all know that, right? I mean, I've been married for 20 years. I love my wife. She's one of the smartest people I know. And I would never, I can't imagine taking that away from someone. You know what I mean? Taking away the ability to learn, to, to grow, to be, you know, the person they want to be. And that seems very foreign to us in this country because it's not allowed for a good reason. So that, that's another huge thing um, in some parts of the world. A lot of that is sometimes religion based, you know, uh, but, you know, at the same time, you know, slowly but surely there are parts that used to be, let's say, quote unquote, more strict, have loosened up. All right. And I'm not going to go into any of that because I'm not well versed on all of the rules. So I'm not, you know, where where it is religion based. Let's just put it that way that um, some of those restrictions have been lifted in certain parts of the world. Maybe not everywhere, but in certain parts. Another key was reduce child mortality. Well, obviously. Um, you know, again, we take it for granted in this country, babies are being born every day in hospitals, but that's not always the case in the rest of the world. You know, and you want to try to reduce deaths of children by taking care of the mothers, better health care, you know, and that, that's, that's the next one there, Imp improve maternal health. You know, you got to, if a woman is pregnant, you know, give her all of the, uh, all of the possible medical th um, attention you could give them to ensure that the baby's safe, the baby is born, and you know has a chance at life. So th these are big, big, big things. You know these are uh, uh, taking place. Combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Now this was in 2002, but you know HIV and AIDS is still there. Those types of big, big diseases like that that became worldwide. Now we got COVID, right? So that might be on this list. Malaria is always an issue. Those stupid little mosquitoes that carry the, mal uh, the malaria virus. And that's a huge issue, especially in the equatorial regions where, you know, like there's um, small tribes and stuff like that. And it's, you know, I believe if I'm not mistaken, there's a vaccine for you. you take a vaccine and you're pretty much immune to it. But getting those vaccines to those small out of the way villages and then having them understand why you're giving them a needle in their arm is a whole nother different ball of wax. So, you know, making sure these diseases and the other part is, and I didn't mention this, is keeping these diseases in check, meaning don't let them get spread out again. You know, HIV and AIDS was massive problem, especially in the late eighties. And it's been condensed because, you know, it became a worldwide, um, uh, area of concern. And so a lot of money and politics and everything went into fighting it. And nowadays, you know, it's not an automatic death sentence like it was a while back. Um, in, ensure environmental sustainability is the next bullet point. So obviously that's what this whole class is about. So this project did touch on all this and everything before this, okay, all of the, you know, the AIDS and mortality, 
all of those play a role in environmental sustainability because you know having women be able to care for their children requires a, a healthy environment so they all play a role together and then finally develop a global par partnership so starting to get the countries to talk to each other to say hey you know here's our common goal what can we do together to get this done um, you know a big part of that is like let's, let's using fishing for example you know overfishing and you know a country like Japan relies heavily on the ocean they're an island they eat a lot of seafood in Japan the problem is is there's also a lot of people in Japan and then you have China right there too they eat a lot of seafood so the amount of fishing that's been taking place is just on epic scales to the point where there's entire areas that are almost void of fish now. Um, it's a real concern. So, you know, if the, the countries can work together to fit, say, hey, maybe we could do this, this and this, develop some fish hatcheries or whatever, work together on this stuff, maybe, you know, the, the, the overfishing will come down a little bit. So the UN, the develop the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is the United Nations. So they developed their own 17 goals. I'm not going to go into all of them. And obviously, this is sort of um, these overreaching ideas of uh, you know the big picture ideas, and then they try to you know address them as best you can from a global perspective so no poverty well no every of course we want no poverty is that realistic i don't know but you it's worth the try right zero hunger that's good i mean you know uh, a big part of un is relief efforts for uh, uh underprivileged areas of the world good health and well-being Obviously, you know, we talked about the mortality rates and stuff like that. Good education, number four, and gender equality, which we talked about. Clean water and sanitation. This is a huge one because a lot of numbers three, four, or I'm sorry, uh, and numbers two, three, and, you know, th those are dictated by having clean water and sanitation. If you're drinking nasty water, you're probably going to get sick. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it it's definitely plays a huge role and um, I know we have students where I work my day job at UWM who have done little projects to develop very simple economical um, water filtration systems for areas that could use it um, they took it down I forgot I think they went to Costa Rica if I remember correctly um, and took took their system down there it's a, a series of uh, different um filters and then by the time the water gets out the end it's it's much cleaner uh number seven affordable and clean energy again that's a tough one because the economics don't all aren't such that you know some third world developing country can afford you know a whole wind field a wind farm you know stuff like that um decent work and economic growth of course i mean it, the better the economy the more the other things start to take care of themselves. Industry, innovation, and infrastructure, yep. So when you start having economic growth, you're gonna have more industry. With industry, you, you'll have innovation. Innovation usually comes from competition, right? So if somebody's doing something, somebody else wants to figure out how to do it better, all right? And then infrastructure goes without saying, you gotta have everything in place. And when I say infrastructure, I mean, you know, utilities, you know, gas, electric, stuff, uh, roads, decent roads, so the shipments of things can get in and out efficiently. That's why, you know, we have good freeway systems in this country, because the, the trucks need to be able to get through unimpeded. Sorry, I'm looking at a spider over there. Don't worry, he's not that big. Um, responsible consumption and production now this is more of a social aspect in our country we you know a lot has been done to you know figure out ways of you know getting people to not consume as much and uh you know over over package like we talked about before 
On 13 is climate action. That is obviously a huge, huge problem that's being talked about constantly everywhere around the world, the global ch climate change. Um, life below water, Earth is 70% ocean. So we gotta figure out how to make sure it stays healthy. And that goes into number 13, it goes into overproduction and things like that. Life on land, well, that's where we live. So we wanna take care of that as well. And then peace, justice and strong institutions and partnerships so making sure that you know justice is being done to those who sort of break the rules whereas making sure that things are being done peacefully because again political unrest can cause huge problems with any one of these so you know places like um kenya and some of the other African nations where you have dictators or you have some type of group that'll come in and try to take over the country. It's really hard to do any of this when you have that kind of civil unrest. You know, and that's where 17 comes in, trying to get everybody to buy in. And I mean, everybody first from the, you know, the all the countries, you know, the political part, the political leaders to understand these are important goals. So <clears throat> these are just some um, more expanded versions of that. So no poverty, try to eliminate poverty by 2030. Um, you know, is, that's a great goal. Let's try, you know, and you wanna try to do that. That is gonna be a tough one. I mean, it's just, it, it will be because it's hard to just take a country as a whole and say, okay, you're no longer in poverty. Bangladesh, in, uh, which is right next to India, is one of the poorest countries in the world. How do you take a country like that and just in 20 years or 10 years from now, actually now it's in 10 years and change it to a, you know, a developed nation where there's no poverty? That's, that's a tough order. That's a tough order. And that goes along with zero hunger. So trying to get not just you know, the big corporate farms, but the small scale farms changing eating habits even a little bit getting away from certain things and adding more of others because they're easier to grow <clears throat> clean water clean water and sanitation you have to have that in order for any any um area to grow and because without it you're just going to go backwards you're going to have too many sick people you're going to have i mean the whole point is to get rid of poverty and hunger Poverty is based upon economics, getting people to work, getting, you know, having a developing economy that usually goes hand in hand with the clean water because the more economy you have, the more money you have, so to speak, it's easier to take care of these issues like clean water. Climate action, you know, produce national and international policies for future climate change. That's already being done, okay? and then a fund for countries to help respond to those things. You know, it, it takes money to do this stuff. We all know that it takes a lot of money. And then again, you, you know, unless if you make policies, you know, how do you go tell this person over here, hey, you have to do this, otherwise we're gonna shut you down. And that's always been something that's always bothered me a little bit is that <clears throat> in America, we can always do better, right? But we are still at, you know, we're still, we're, we're over consumers, but when it comes to the pollution aspect, we've cleaned up our act a lot since the 60s and 70s. Whereas other countries who are still catching up are probably, um, they're polluting much more than we are, even though we, all the pressure seems to be on America to make it happen. We can't just do it alone. This has got to be a global thing. Again, it all goes back to the buy-in. And then here's another example, life below water, okay? Reduce ocean pollution. Well, you know, there are countries out there, including America, who have dumped a lot of garbage in the ocean. All of New York City's garbage gets shipped out on a barge several miles offshore and dumped. And it's, they've been doing that for like 40 years. It's nasty, but they get away with it or something. I don't know how they... Um, <clears throat> And then you have managed ocean fisheries and ecosystems. Again, this is a big, big deal in certain parts of the world is overfishing. And then so maybe set aside 10% of that area for conservation, which will 
increase fish populations in general. You know, fish don't just stay in one little area. So if you if you set aside an area that gives them a chance to grow, ultimately they will, you know, move around and you could still kind of fish in other areas and reap the benefits of the conservation. Now, sustainability and practice. So what what needs to kind of what practices need to either change or um, we need to sustain our agriculture. Agriculture is, you know, our food basket, right? We, you know, you have to um, develop farming methods that can be used indefinitely, and so they don't deplete the, you know, the natural balance of the soil. And again, <coughs> excuse me, in our country, this is, you know, agricultural is a, is a huge business, and the, these type of things have always been there because it benefits the farmer. So the farmer doesn't have to worry about, you know, killing off his, his crop because of bad practices. They want to do it as well as possible, as efficiently as possible to get the highest yield. Sustainable development. So you want to be able to develop these ideas and these practices um, for future generations. And that's kind of the whole goal of sustainability. Sustainable energy. Obviously, we want renewable resources that have a low in, uh, environmental impact. And right now, you know, it, there's that big push in wind farms. Uh, sustainable fishing. I've been mentioning this over and over again. You know, you don't realize it, how much fishing is being done in the oceans. You know, oh, there are not fish just everywhere. Fish have a tendency to congregate in areas because of the environmental, their habit, it's their habitat. So you can't just go in the middle of the ocean and expect to find fish. You have to go where the fish are. The problem is, is if you keep going to where the fish are, pretty soon there won't be any fish left. Um, same thing with cattle grazing, allow animals to graze in a way that keeps everything healthy. You see this more and more in stores, grass fed cows. And what that is, is they're just allowing the cows to do their thing. They're not overfeeding them, plumping them up on corn and grain and all that stuff. It's just letting them be, let them eat, um, and then, you know, that, uh, that goes into, let's say, the quality of the meat, the taste of the meat, things like that. And there's always all other options as well for sustainability. Okay, so another summit was sort of uh, convened, and this time it was sort of a bunch of scientists who try are looking at the, the sustainability from a whole different perspective. So they're looking at it from the scientific side of it. And what I mean by that is they developed a methodology or a, sort of a, a framework, a scientific framework for looking at this. And it's based on the law of thermodynamics, which I won't go into, but for the purposes of the sustainability, it's the rate of resource use in relation to its renewal. Okay, how fast are we using up the resources compared to its renewal rate, which is more of a scientific method of looking at it than just, you know, sort of a conceptual one. Now, the, the defi they define sustainability as a state in which humankind extracts natural resources at rates that do not exceed our capacity to either discover replacement ones or substitute resources. Well, that makes sense, right? And we've been talking about that through all these slides and we're gonna, it's a common theme, you know, being renewable versus non-renewable resources. You know, are you taking out of the earth more than what's being put back into it? So this gentleman, Carl Henrik Robert, developed a framework for this based on these ideas that they can't be increased, they have to be decreased. So if you read these three um, uh, statements at the bottom, you can just say the amount of substances extracted from the earth must be decreased in order for sustainability to be a viable um, option. The amount of waste produced as a byproduct must be decreased over time. And the rate of degradation of the planet um, by physical means needs to be decreased over time. All right, all three of these things must be done in order to sort of achieve a sustainable environment. Again, they looked at it like from more of a scientific framework. 
Now, these all make sense, and you can almost quantify some of the stuff. You can almost put numbers to it in order to kind of gauge what's going on. You know, they have they have numbers that um, for things like, you know, how much oil is possibly left in the earth. They, you know, they have sort of rough ideas of how much that is, you know, how long it's going to last us or how much gold is left or coal or things like this. But they do still discover things as well. And sometimes, you know, that that plays a role into recalculating the amount that's available. So again, the scientific framework is trying to understand the rate of resource use in relation to its renewal. And we already have talked about renewal rates. So trees are on the order of maybe 100 years, right? You can grow a tree, a decent sized tree in 100 years, right? Oil takes millions of years to develop. So these types of things, you know, there, there's, <laughs> yeah. So you want to try to, as you're extracting the oil, which we know we're extracting faster than the rate of renewal, we need to be able to figure out ways to substitute that. All right. So that's what they're trying to look at with this sort of scientific frame framework. Well, with this becomes this new thing called backcasting. And it's using this framework that it's used for problem solving. So rather than looking at what's going on now and projecting it forward, we want to go jump forward and figure out where we want to be in 100 years and then work backwards to ensure that we can achieve that goal. All right. So backcasting begins with the end in mind rather than projecting the forward conditions, which is what pretty much what all businesses do, the stock market. Yeah, you have things like futures and stuff like that, but it's go it's based upon what's going on in the near future, not like sort of there's no end game for it. So it asks, what do we need to do today to reach that successful outcome? Okay, how do we get to that point? And rather than say, well, if we change this now or this now, based on what's going on today, this is says, no, this is our goal. Here's how we go and get it. And then um, uh, you you go backwards in order to achieve that goal, where as opposed to forecasting, which we all know from like the weather, it extrapolates what's happening now into the future, and then you make adjustments. It's a very different mindset to be able to look at the end game and then work backwards. And so that's what they're trying to do with this backcasting. And it's now become more and more prevalent when it comes to things like climate change and stuff like that. Don't look at what's going on today. Say, okay, we need zero amount of this. What do we have to do to get there? Let's go backwards from that point. So in the book, they talk about a working definition of sustainability. What does that mean? Well, that means it could change, it can morph, it can, it, you know, but what they do is what the book did, and you'll see it in, in chapter two, is they took all of these reports and all of these, you know, climate change and sustainability and all of these different facets and kind of put them all together, a term we use called amalgamate. We amalgamate them all together to I try to, you know, hone in, try to build a more concise definition of what sustainability actually is. Well, according to the book, and I'm going to read this right off the slide because so what they do, you'll see the X there. We could use that as, let's say, a company. X is or will be sustainable if it meets the current generations or increases their opportunity to meet their own needs without compromising the ability, the ability of future generations to do so. This is best achieved using a participatory, inclusive process based on scientific systems thinking and backcasting principle. Now, from doing that, you have these three bullet points underneath. If those do, you're looking at trying to figure out ways to do that, all right? How do you do that? Well, extraction and use of resources that maximize renewal. So don't take out more than what you can put in. Reuse, encourages reuse, minimizes waste. Well, we're on, we've been on the path for that for 30 years, and you know, we're recycling bins and things like that and protects the gov the environment. Well, we have lots of groups that do that, including conservation and preservation of natural systems. Setting aside land to just let it be, natural wild fields and things like that. 
slowing or reversing global climate change. Well, obviously that's an important thing. We've talked about it, we're gonna talk about it some more. So that's one of the principle that this, the next one is economic development and equitable economic opportunity, including profit that does not undermine the capacity of the people to meet their own needs. What does that mean? That means allowing countries or entities, states, counties, whatever, the ability to go towards alternative sources, but don't make it so cost prohibitive that it becomes um, something that they won't even look at anymore. All right, it doesn't, so you, it's sort of that balancing. Well, oil is cheap, all right? Oil is really cheap, so we're just gonna use oil for all of our energy needs. Well, the problem with that is, is yeah, oil is cheaper, but it also has much more uh, downsides to it with pollution and things like that. So balancing out the need for, okay, maybe if we install 15 wind, uh, uh, wind generators, you know, that would offset that a little bit. Is the cost prohibitive? Can we make a profit from it? And I mentioned in an earlier slide that one wind generator that's down at the Port of Milwaukee makes a ton of electricity to the point where they're selling it now. So that, that's another one of these working sustainability is ensuring that you can still use alternative methods and make a profit from it. And then finally, an elevated standard of human well-being for all people, including but not limited to, to health, nutrition, clean air and water, increased education, other human rights. So we've so seen these through the UN um, initiatives. All right, so all of these play a role in trying to define what sustainability is. And this is no fault, small uh, feat, as you can see. There's a lot going on here. But the idea is, is to get everybody on board. And when I say everybody, I don't mean just America. I mean, the world has to get on board with this. And that's where it gets difficult because some, some developing countries are just scraping by. They're not worried about wind farms. They just wanna feed their people. So this is where all of that balancing takes place. So when you're gonna look at the book and read all this, it shows you a nice big graph of all of the different documents that they use to generate this. So, and then there's a couple of examples with a Massachusetts wind farm and another one, I apologize, I don't remember what it is. Make sure you read those examples at the end of chapter two, all right? So they take this working definition and apply it to two different entities to see if it fits the definition of sustainability. All right, so that's all I got for chapter two. It's a little bit shorter, um, in number of slides, although I've still talked for over an hour. <laughs> so hopefully you, you can see that these are big picture uh, problems that need to be dealt with. And over the course of the semester, we're gonna look at these even more in depth. All right, so um, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing for the next section, but I'll get it done soon enough. All right, well, take care, we'll see you soon.